The Thief by Megan Whalen Turner Narrated by the Reading Dragon Chapter 2 Two guards came for me late the next morning, and I was surprised again. I had thought that the traveling the Magus had mentioned would take some time to plan for. He had clearly gotten the king's approval for the plan only the previous night. My hopes, which had been falling and rising, sank again as I realized that the Magus hadn't mentioned how far we would travel. It might be no more than a few miles. But I cheered up once I was free of my chains. The guards removed the manacles this time, as well as the waist and ankle cuffs. There were no clanking noises to accompany us as we walked down the gallery past the row of cell doors to the guard room. The only sound was the tramp of feet, the guards, not mine, and the creaking of the leather jackets that they wore under their steel breastplates. We crossed through the guard room to the door to the courtyard between the prison and the megaron. When the door opened, I learned in an instant that the light of the lamps the night before had been nothing to compare with the sun itself. It was nearly noon, and the sunlight dropped directly into the courtyard. The pale yellow of the stones in the walls reflected it from all sides. I howled and swore as I covered my head with my arms and hunched over in pain. Burning at the stake couldn't have been worse. It's a funny thing that the new gods have been worshipped in Sonus since the invaders came, but when people need a truly satisfying curse, they call on the old gods. I called on all of them, one right after another, and used every curse I'd overheard in the lower city. God damned! God's damned! I was howling as the guards led me, completely blind, down the stairs. I still had my hands over my eyes, and they held me firmly by the elbows. My feet hardly touched the stone steps. At the bottom, the Magus was waiting. He told me to pull myself together. "'Gods damn you, too!' I said through my hands. One of the guards gave me a brisk shake, and I almost cursed him as well, but decided to concentrate on the pain in my eyes. It didn't fade much, but after a few minutes, when I tilted my hands a little away from my face and looked down, I could make out the flagstones through my tears. I sniffed a little and wiped the tears away. As soon as I could manage, I pulled my hands farther from my face and tried to see what was happening around me in the courtyard. I had plenty of time. There was an incredible amount of noise as horses crashed back and forth across the flagstones and the Magus shouted at people. Not far away, someone was unpacking a brace of saddlebags and scattering the contents under the feet of a nervous horse. The horse kept sliding away from the mess and was dragged back by the groom holding its head. Evidently, something was missing from the saddlebags. With more swearing, the Magus sent the unpacker back into the castle to fetch whatever it was. "'Look for it on the bench next to the retort!' shouted the Magus at the disappearing figure. "'That's where it was when I told you to pack it the first time! Idiot!' he muttered under his breath. By the time the idiot returned, I could see he was carrying a small square leather case, which he dropped into the saddlebag. He then shoveled the waiting piles back in on top of it. The noise in the courtyard diminished as the Magus stopped shouting and the horses calmed down. I was still looking at the world through tears and the narrowest of slits between my eyelids. I counted the hazy shapes in front of me. It didn't seem like a large party, only five horses, but all of them had humped baggage behind their saddles. It was going to be a long trip. I grinned with satisfaction. Beside me, the Magus looked up at the sky and said to no one in particular, I had planned to leave by daybreak, Pole, he shouted. Get the boys mounted. I'll load the thief. I didn't appreciate the way he spoke of me as another parcel to be dumped into a saddlebag, or, in my case, a saddle. He walked over to a horse, and I could see that he gestured to me to join him, but I didn't move. I hate horses. I know people who think that they are noble, graceful animals, but regardless of what a horse looks like from a distance, never forget that it is as likely to step on your foot as look at you. What? I dissembled. Get on the horse, you idiot. Me? Of course you, you fool. I didn't move, and the Magus got tired of waiting. He stepped to my side, grabbed me by the back of the neck, and hauled me over to the horse. I set my heels in and resisted. If I was going to climb onto an animal eight times my size, I wanted to plan the attempt first. The Magus was a good bit stronger than I was. 
Holding me by the cloth at the back of my neck, he shook once or twice and my head swam. I heard the cheap cloth tear. He grabbed for a firmer grip on my neck. Put your left foot in the stirrup, he said. Your left one. I did as I was told, and two of the grooms stepped over to lever me into the saddle before my brains had settled. Once up, I shook the hair back out of my eyes. As I tried to get it to hook behind my ears, I looked around. Being six feet off the ground does give one a sense of superiority. I shrugged my shoulders and crossed my arms, but the animal underneath me lurched sideways, and I had to uncross them in order to snatch at the front of the saddle. I held on while I waited for the others to mount. Once the others were up, the Magus directed his mount toward the archway at one side of the courtyard. My horse obediently followed, and the others came behind me as we passed under rooms of the palace and hallways that I had been in the night before. My eyes had a few moments of relief before we reached the outer gate. There was no fanfare, no shouting crowds to wish us luck on our journey, just as well. The only time I had been the focus of shouting crowds had been my trial, and I hadn't enjoyed that at all. We weren't leaving through the main gate of the Megaron, so we emptied out into a narrow street, only a little wider than the horses. My feet brushed against the whitewashed walls on either side. We twisted through more narrow streets until we reached the Sacred Way, which we followed down to the gate out of the old city. The gate was made out of blocks of stone, bigger across than I am tall, something else supposedly built by the old gods. It was topped by a solid stone lintel with two carved lions that were supposed to roar if an enemy of the king passed beneath them. At least they were said to be lions. The stone had been weathered by the centuries, and only indistinct monster figures remained, facing each other over a short pillar. They remained silent as we passed under. The king's route was wide and straight, crossing the more circuitous sacred way twice again before reaching the docks. When first built, the route had been bordered by stone walls that defended this road that connected the city to its harbor and its ships. The lawn walls were later dismantled to provide building materials for each new wing of the king's megaron as it grew from a one-room stronghold to a four-story palace. As we rode onto the avenue, the sound of our horses' hooves was muddled with other noises of the city. It was just before midday, and we were in the middle of the last surge of activity before people withdrew into their homes to wait out the afternoon heat. There were a few other horses on the road, and many more donkeys. People traveled on foot and in sedan chairs carried by servants. Merchants brought their goods up the avenue in carts and then led loaded donkeys down the narrow alleys to the back doors of the great houses, hoping to sell their vegetables to the cook, their linen to the housekeeper, or their wine to the steward. There was jostling and shouting and noise, and I relished it after the perpetual smothered quiet of the prison. We threaded our way through the traffic, drawing curious looks. My companions were dressed in sturdy traveling clothes. I was still in the clothes I had worn to prison. My tunic had started life in a cheerful yellow that I thought was dashing when I'd gotten it from a merchant in the lower city. It had faded to a greasy beige color. In addition to the smaller tears in the elbows, it had a larger one across my shoulders, thanks to the ministrations of the king's magus. I wondered what he thought I was going to wear if he persisted in shredding my clothes. We crossed the upper part of the sacred way, and then the lower part, which held all the nicest shops in the city. Looking up and down it from the intersection, I could see the sedan chairs and fancy carriages waiting by doorways while the gently bred owners made their purchases inside. One shop near the corner sold only earrings, and I watched wistfully as it went by. We were too far away, and there was too much traffic to allow even a glimpse of the merchandise displayed in its window. Once we got to the lower town, traffic thinned out as people retreated indoors. I looked in vain for a familiar face. I wanted to tell someone I knew that I was free, but I didn't know very many people who would be out on the street in the middle of the day. When we reached the docks, we turned and rode along beside them toward the north gate out of the city. We passed the merchant ships and a pier full of private boats for fishing and pleasure, and then the king's warships lined up at their docks. I was counting the cannons bolted to their decks and almost didn't see Philonikes passing by me. Philonikes! I yelled, leaning out of the saddle. Hey, Philonikes! 
It was as much as I said before the Magus grabbed my arm and dragged me away. He kicked his horse into a trot, and mine as well, as he hauled me down the street. I turned backward to wave to Filani Keys disappearing around the corner, but I'm not sure that he recognized me. The Magus turned another corner before we slowed down, the other four riders hurrying to catch up. Damn it, said the Magus. What do you think you're doing? I pointed backward and looked bewildered. Philo's a friend of mine. I was going to say hello. Do you think I want everyone in the city to know that you are out working for the king? Why not? Do you announce that you're going off to steal something before you start? He thought for a second. Yes, you do. Well, I don't. Why not? I asked again. None of your business. Just keep your mouth shut. Do you understand? Sure, I shrugged. The knot we made of horses and riders in the middle of the street broke up as we restarted our journey. I ducked my head to hide my smile as my horse clopped along after the Maguses. At the south gate, we went once again through a cool tunnel, this one much longer than the one through the Megaron. It passed under the sloping earthwork and newer city wall. Then we were out in the sunshine again. Not that the city ended at the walls. The invaders, in their officious and sensible way, had brought prosperity to the city, and it had never stopped growing larger than its boundaries. We rode past the fine houses of the merchants who chose not to live squeezed into the city. Over the tops of garden walls we could see the citrus, the fig, and the almond trees, shading the grass or the edge of the veranda. The horses provided a sort of moving platform, allowing glimpses into other people's privacy. I would have preferred to climb the walls and look my fill. I didn't like the way the view kept disappearing behind the dark green leaves of an orange tree just as I got interested. Beyond the villas, the farms began. The fields stretched perfectly flat on either side of us for miles in every direction. There was not even an undulation in the ground, it seemed, until the road reached the foothills of the Hephaestial Mountains, many miles ahead of us. Somewhere in our right, between us and the sea, should have been the river Sepertia, but I couldn't see it, even from the back of a horse. I stood up in my stirrups to look, but I could only guess that the water was hidden behind a line of trees that grew along its banks. My knees began to quiver after only a moment, so I sat down again. The horse made a little huffing noise of complaint. Don't pull on the reins, the man on my right said. I looked down at the pieces of leather held in my hands and dropped them all together. The animal obviously knew where it was going without my guidance. We passed field after field of onions and an occasional smaller field of cucumber or watermelon. The watermelons were as big as my head, so it was later in the summer than I thought. It had taken a long time to get out of prison. We rode on through the heat. The late summer heat, the Atessians, hadn't come yet, and nothing moved in the entire landscape. The sun beat down, and even the dust didn't try to rise. We passed a grove of olive trees set in front of a farmhouse. Their silver-green leaves could have been carved out of stone. In the city, I had wanted to hug the sunlight and wrap it around myself like a blanket. I'd burn my body in the saddle in order to expose as much of my skin as possible into direct light. It was pleasant at first, but by the time the city was a single lump of gold stone behind us, I felt as if I were wearing a coat of dirt and dried sweat that had shrunk to be two sizes too small. I itched everywhere. The smells of the prison floated down the road with me, and I think that even the horse underneath me objected. I noticed that as the sun got hotter, the two riders on either side of me moved farther and farther away. I looked over the party. The Magus had already studied. On my right was the soldier who warned me about pulling on the reins. His profession was obvious, as was the sword tucked under the flap of one of his saddlebags. I guess that he was the pole that the Magus had shouted to in the courtyard, because the other two members of the group were certainly the boys. One younger and one several years older, I guessed, than myself. Why they were with us, I couldn't imagine. The older one also had a sword in a scabbard, and with coaching he could probably chop up a straw man. But the younger one looked to be completely useless. They were both obviously well-bred, not servants, and I wondered if they were brothers. Like the Magus, they were dressed in dark blue tunics that flared at the waist over their trousers. 
The older one had darker hair and was the better looking. He looked as if he knew it. Riding on my left, he wrinkled his nose whenever a small wind wafted from my direction, but he never looked over at me. The younger boy rode mostly behind me, and every time I turned my head to glance at him, I found him staring back. I identified them as useless the elder and useless the younger for the time being. The heat grew intolerable, and I grew more exhausted with every lurch of the horse I was riding. After what seemed like hours of swaying in the saddle, I realized that a fall was inevitable if we didn't stop. I'm tired, I said. I'm tired. There was no response. The Magus didn't even turn his head. So I made a decision for myself. I slid sideways down the side of the horse, trusting that the leg I left behind would come after me. It did, though not gracefully. The horse was still moving as I reached the ground, and I had to hop a few steps on one leg until my other leg caught up. Once I had both feet planted in the dust of the road, I headed for the grass beside it. I stepped into a ditch and, coming out of it, stumbled onto my knees and then onto my stomach that and didn't get up. The soldier must have come after me like a shot. I felt his fingers grab for my shirt as I fell. Everyone else dismounted and trooped across the ditch as well, until they were standing around me in a half circle. I opened my eyes for a moment to look at their boots, then closed them again. "'What's the matter with him, Magus?' It must have been the younger one that asked. "'God's damn! We're only halfway to Mathana, and I wanted to get to Matinia tonight. He's exhausted, that's all. Not enough food to keep him going. No, just leave him,' as someone prodded me with a boot. "'Oh, thank God,' I thought. "'They're going to leave me.' All I wanted to do was lie in the dirty, prickly grass with my feet in a ditch forever. I could be a convenient sort of mile marker, I thought. Get to the thief and you know you're halfway to Mathana, wherever Mathana might be. But they didn't leave me. They unsaddled their horses and got out their lunches and sat and ate while I slept. When the sun was halfway down the sky, Pole nudged me with one foot until I woke up. I twitched my eyes open and had no idea at all where I was. I wasn't in bed. I wasn't at home. I'd woken up several times disoriented in the prison, and I automatically stifled my first thrash of surprise to prevent my chains from grinding on old bruises. And finally, I remembered that there were no chains. I crossed one arm over my face and moaned convincingly. I felt surprisingly well. I was as hungry as a donkey, but my head was clear. I sat up and rubbed at the stiffness on the side of my face where the grass had left its rough pattern. I groaned and complained while Pole, single-handed, pushed me back up onto the horse and we all started down the road again. The Magus rode beside me and handed me pieces of cheese and lumps of bread that he tore off a loaf as we went. I ate with one hand and held on with the other. Horses are the most awful means of transport. I wanted to ask why they hadn't brought a cart, but I was too busy eating. We made it to Mathana as the sun was going down. It was a small town with just a few houses and an inn at an intersection of roads. We didn't stop. We rode on until it was pitch dark. The moon was just a tiny sickle, and the soldier dismounted to lead his horse. He walked slowly to avoid stepping into the ditch by the roadside, and the other horses followed his. The night air was cool, but my wonderful nap was a long way behind me. I balanced on the narrow back of my horse and wished the saddle offered more support. My head drooped forward and then bobbed back. The Magus must have had eyes like a thief because he told Pole to stop and dismounted to walk alongside me, one hand resting just above my knee, ready to shake me if I fell asleep. He shook hard and resorted to pinching periodically. We reached Matinia at last. It was no bigger than Mathana had been, but more roads met there. The inn was two stories tall and had a gate beside it that led to an enclosed courtyard. As we rode up, a groomsman came to take the horses. We all slid to the ground, and Pole was quickly beside me with one hand firmly on my shoulder. It was an easy business for him. My shoulder came only to his chest. Sometimes it bothers me that I am so small. It bothered me then, and I shrugged my shoulder in irritation, but his hand didn't move. The Magus introduced himself as a traveling landholder to the owner of the inn that said that he had sent a messenger ahead to arrange rooms. The owner was delighted to see him, and we all trooped toward the doorway. As I passed the owner's wife, 
Her nose wrinkled, and as I reached the door, she protested. That one, she accused, pointing at me. It's that one that smells so awful, and he's not coming into my wine room, and I won't have him sleeping in any of my clean beds. Her husband made futile hushing motions with his hands. No, I won't have it! Not if he's your lordship's son, she said to the magus. Although I hope he's not. I could feel my face getting hot as the blood rushed all the way up to my ears. The magus and the woman negotiated over the husband's protest. The magus said no, I couldn't sleep in the barn, but I could sleep on the floor. He gave her an extra silver coin and promised I would wash immediately. She gave directions to the pump in the courtyard and Pole led me away. The pump was in the middle of the courtyard behind the inn. There were two stables on two sides, a wall on the third, and the back of the inn completed the courtyard. It was not a private place to take a bath. When we reached the pump, Pole grabbed my shirt at the waist and jerked it upward. I snapped my arms down to prevent it from going over my head. The fabric tore in his hands. He reached for me again, but I stepped away, drowsiness gone. This, I snapped, I can do for myself. Just make sure it's a good job, he said before he began to pump. The water gushed out of a pipe at the height of my waist as I stripped out of my overshirt and dumped it on the cobbles. I pulled off my shoes. I had no stockings, so the pants followed immediately after. As the water splashed off the cobbled stones and onto my naked legs, goose flesh came out under the dirt. I shivered and swore as I bent into the stream. While I rinsed under the pump, the younger useless arrived. He kept well away from the splattering water. Put those down in a dry spot, said Pole, and fetch a couple of sacks from the stable. When useless came back, Pole took one of the sacks he brought and handed it to me with a square block of soap. Crouching beside the water, I soaked the sack and rubbed the soap across it. It made a tremendous lather, and I stopped to smell it in surprise. I laughed. It was the Magus' scented soap. Useless Younger must have dug it out of one of the saddlebags. I scrubbed myself with the sacking, washing away what felt like years of dirt. I rubbed hard and then rinsed and soaked myself again before Pole could stop pumping water. I dragged the sack across the back of my neck and as much of my shoulders as I could reach and scrubbed my face again and again, thinking to myself that my nose would be smaller, but at least it would be clean. The Younger Useless stood and watched and I wondered what he thought of me. The iron waistband had left deep bruises in a circle around my waist, and I was covered in flea bites and sores, but the ones on my wrists were the worst. Where the manacles had chafed, there were raw spots partially covered in scabs that were black against my prison fare skin. Once I had cleaned most of the dirt off myself and rinsed my hair, I squatted down in front of the spraying water and tried to find the place where the water would fall most gently on my wrists. Several of the sores were infected, and they needed to be cleaned out, but it was going to be a painful business. My whole body was shaking with the cold, and I clenched my teeth to keep them from chattering while I leaned into the water. Pole stepped around the pump and leaned over me to look at the sores. The water flow slackened. Leave them, he said. I'll work on them inside. He gave me another piece of sacking to dry off with, and when I was done, he handed me a pile of clothes. Pants and a shirt, as well as an overshirt and a pair of stout work boots. I looked around for my own clothes and saw the younger useless disappearing into the stable with them in his arms. Hey! I yelled. Come back with those! He turned around uncertainly. Magus told me to burn them, he said. Everything but my shoes! Useless looked into the pile in his arms and wrinkled his nose. All right, but if the Magus says to burn them, you'll have to give them back. Fine, fine, I said as I hopped across the wet cobblestones in my bare feet and took my shoes out of his arms. The rest of the clothing I consigned to the fires without regret, but I'd had the shoes made specially. They were low boots, just a little higher than my ankles, reinforced on the soles, but still supple enough to let me move unsuspected through other people's houses. I carried them back to pole. Then I looked for a dry place to stand while I got dressed. The pants were heavy cotton and bagged at the ankle where they tucked into my shoes. They bagged even more around my waist, but there was a belt to hold them up. The shirt was cotton as well. There was something wonderful about rubbing a clean shirt against clean skin. 
I was smiling by the time I pulled the overshirt over my head. It was dark blue and short-sleeved. It came down to my thighs and was enough too big that when I moved my arms across my chest, I didn't bind. I checked to be sure. God bless the Magus, he thinks of everything, doesn't he? I said to Paul. He grunted and waved me toward the inn's back door. We went inside to the tap room, where the Magus and the two uselesses were waiting for us. There were deep bowls of stew set on the table, but before Paul would let me have mine, he wanted to look at my wrists. The Magus looked over his shoulder and then sent the elder useless up to his room to get a relief kit with bandages and little pots to salve it in. Paul got one of the lanterns off the wall and put it on the table beside him. The landlady tisked tisked and brought out a bowl of warm water, a cloth, and more soap. Paul started to work on the right wrist first, while I looked at my dinner regretfully. After he had rinsed it with the soapy water, he rubbed a little salve on top of the scabs on the two sores, one above each of the bones in my wrists. Then he wrapped the wrist carefully in a clean white bandage. It was a tidy job, and I was impressed. I was off my guard when he took up my left arm. There was just one sore, but it ran all the way across the top of my wrist. Instead of a scab, it had raw patches and bubbles of fluid trapped under flaps in the skin. Without any warning, Paul slid a knife under one of the flaps and twisted it open. I screamed at the top of my lungs. Everyone in the room jumped, including Paul, but his knife was well away from my wrist by then. I struggled to get out of his grip, but he had his hand clamped on my forearm, and he held on like a vice. I tried with my right hand to pry his fingers loose, but they didn't budge. As I went on yelling and twisting his fingers, Paul, without a word, put his knife down on the table and reached into the relief kit. What he brought out was the wooden gag they put in someone's mouth before doing something drastic, like cutting off a leg. He held it in front of my face. That's enough, he said. I thought about explaining that that sore had been there for weeks. I'd been so careful not to let the manacles bang it, and I favored it and done everything I could to keep it from hurting anymore, and he could have warned me before he stuck his great goddamn knife into it. But I looked at the gag in his hand and shut my mouth. I contented myself with wriggling and whimpering a little as he opened each of the infected spots cleaned the entire sore, and rubbed salve onto it. When he had it wrapped in a bandage, I sniffed and wiped my nose and turned to the table to eat my dinner. Useless the Elder was looking at me in amusement. Not exactly stalwart, are you? he said. I told him what he could do with his own dinner and got a poke in the ribcage from Pole's elbow. I sulked through the first few bites of my stew before I noticed how good it was. While I savored it, I listened to the others talking and gathered that the older useless was named Ambiades and the younger Sophos. They weren't related to each other, but they were both apprentices of the Magus. I ate until I was too exhausted to keep my head up anymore and fell asleep on the table with the last bite still in my mouth.